Welcome to Lesson 8. This is Chef Jack. Thanks for joining me for another fun-packed video. <laughs> and actually, this is our last video. Can you believe we've been through eight weeks of this? Anyways, the final chapter we're going to talk about is food consumption. So think about it at home and then also when we go out to eat and all the people that we serve in our bakeries and restaurants. So this one, I think I'm, I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm just going to go a little bit more of a conversational style. Hopefully, I'm just trying to mix things up, see how things work. Okay, first one, learning objectives. Describe food intakes, eating patterns in the U.S. and the major trends since the 70s. Nutrients of concern for Americans. And understand some of the utility background of national dietary surveys. Doesn't that sound fun? National Dietary Surveys. <laughs> I'm sure you would all jump to join in one of those. And then assess food waste and its implications in the U.S. You know, food does many things. It's nutritional. You know, we need it for growth and maintenance. But there's also, you know, a psychological, cultural, and social impact of it. Ear of corn. Whenever I go to State Fair Park, I always think, you know, when I was a little one, you know, my family, we went to State Fair Park and I was eating an ear of corn at that little stand. One of my front teeth came out. It was already loose, but that ear of corn helped it on its way. And every time I walk by that corn stand, I always think of my tooth right there. And food memories. You know, I think food memories, as you get older, all of a sudden, you know, you'll have stronger connections or realize you've got stronger connections to the foods that you ate, who you ate them with. You know, any combination of things can all of a sudden evoke a food memory. It's a very strong emotional, cultural tie. And then some of the things what we eat factors influencing our choices. You know, the availability, advertising, costs, habits, attitudes, flavor, our taste change. You know, you don't see too many two-year-olds eating Brussels sprouts, but all of a sudden when you're 20, 25, maybe 30, the awesome Brussels sprouts, beets, all that stuff starts tasting good. Life stage, health, religion, family history, all contribute to what we eat. You know, certainly we, you know, we eat something for pleasure and satiety, satisfying, you know, but the food choices shape the entire food system from the supply to man to supply. You know, it's a circular. So now with all the computers, as soon as you order something, it something is tripped somewhere about, oh, we need another bunch of bananas or we need another something. And that all, you know, impacts what people, or if a, you know, grocery store has too much of something that goes on sale to try to get rid of it. And then that affects the environment, communities, workers. It's all interconnected, what and why we, how we eat. In the book, it talked a little bit about, they're trying to look at national dietary data. So that makes recommendations about healthy diets. And this is, you know, subject to change. And as we learn things, things always change. I always tell people, you know, eat a varied diet, eat stuff that makes you feel good. Use your gut. I mean, your gut literally and figuratively will, you know, help you guide what's good for you and what's not good for you. Listen to your gut. Pesticide residues, food additives. Fortification, so a lot of times, a lot of foods that we eat are fortified with usually vitamins and minerals, but they can do other items too. Total diet approach. You'll focus on the combination of foods and beverages that comprises people's total diets on average over time. So you, you've got to consider everything that you're consuming. So seasonal diets, you eat or crave different things, spring, summer, fall, winter, the holidays, spring, you know, I think of asparagus is a thing that we all think of in, in the spring. We usually start eating it in May. And actually, that's a great diuretic. It really flushes your system. So, you know, maybe there's things that have been built up from the winter time, And then with eating asparagus and other foods is a diuretic that kind of flushes your system. You know, in the summer or fall and winter and holidays, all the different types of foods that we eat and crave. Changing eating patterns. The book talked a little bit about assessing food consumption. On the one hand, you could do food availability assessment where they're measuring basic commodities such as wheat, beef, and eggs at the farm level or early stage processing. That's more of a global level or, you know, having people do 24-hour dietary recall. Different types of methods for assessing individuals. You know, food, write down what you eat, diet history, 
Some of the changes, we have just a greater amount of food available to us. We used to have 14,000 items, now we have 42,000. More foods from around the world and more processed foods. The U.S. has the most varied diet, value-added products versus, you know, 100%, again, your super processed foods. Many do not meet dietary recommendations. You know, they have too many calories, too much sodium, not enough potassium, fiber, calcium, or vitamin D. It gives you the calories, but not always the nutrition. The book talked about, you know, how much the amount of calories that we've increased over the last 30 years or so. And it's about 200 calories that we consume a day more, which isn't a lot, but when you say 200 times a year, now all of a sudden, oh, that's where that three pounds came from, whatever it is. So it's slowly but adds up. Nutrient-dense foods are whole grains, and you're seeing that more and more people are trying to incorporate whole grain versus all-purpose flour so that you're getting the germ, the, the bran, along with the endosperm or the, you know, the highly digestible starch. Key intakes of calories and nutrients. We are consuming a little bit less fat, carbohydrates. You know, but the thing about fat, and I'm getting a little off track here, but to me, I prefer high fat or full whole milk products um, or full fat products because it seems like you know if you have some ice cream some and you take one or two bites of it, that's enough. Something in your body, your brain says, all right, I've had enough. Whereas you can, some cheaper ice creams that are more fillers, it's like you can eat a whole quart of it and you're still not satisfied. And I'm just wondering if that's your brain. Your brain is 70% fatty acids. So it's, or fat like. So it needs, I think, certain items to, you know, make it healthy. And so I just find if I have a full fat ice cream, I take two spoonfuls of it and I'm good versus you could have a, a bowl of blue bunny or something and it's like you're still not satisfied. I think it's your body looking for something that it's not getting. Food safety, a lot of the foods, partially hydrogenated oils or trans fats, you know, they realized it was a cheap substitute, but then all of a sudden they realized that to were exacerbated coronary disease, artery disease, trying to reduce it. But again, it was a a way for the food processors to come up with a cheap, cheaper oil, you know, we paid for in terms of health. High fructose corn syrup, we've talked about before. Again, another highly processed food that's easily digestible. About half of our calories doubled, you know, by eating out. And a lot of women in the workplace, when you go to restaurants, restaurants are not always the same portions or makeup of food that we eat at home amount of food that's consumed away from the home has almost doubled. We talked a little bit about what meals you eat. And I can't stress this enough, eat your breakfast. No matter, you know, toast or whatever it is, get something in your stomach because you're, you know, you've just fasted basically for eight hours. Your body and your brain need some food. Otherwise, you start reaching for the highly processed stuff, which is just carbs. Snacks are good. Descending order. This is a little different. It should be grains, dairy, then protein, vegetables, fruits. Again, you know, just think of when you look at a plate. Is it just a little bit of protein and a bunch of other stuff, or is it big protein and a little bit of stuff? I like this one. White potatoes. Think potato chips and french fries. Milk, very common product, but you know, there's a growing trend of drinking less milk. You're seeing a lot of the nut-based and other type of products that are used for milk or beverage or whatever they're calling it this day but you know people are trying to get away drink less milk and use alternatives which is great be mindful you know when you're cutting out milk that there is a fair amount of nutrition in there and make sure you make up for that another side of eating food is food waste you know just you know they say 31 to 40 percent of the edible food goes uneaten and just think of you know how much food you throw away in a given week you know either at home or at the place of business that you work it's just crazy and if anyone's worked at a grocery store it's like double crazy it just talks about it in raw terms how much is thrown away you know all the food that we throw out you've got all the food insecure americans that are in you know milwaukee wisconsin this country and around the world it just doesn't make sense that we're throwing all this food away and then all the resources to produce that food all the for not and then it ends up in a landfill which contributes to methane gas, which is about 24 times worse than carbon dioxide. You know, try to eat, you know, all the grain that we feed to the animals. Well, let's maybe eat 
the grain or start growing different grains. Diets are no longer seasonal. Even when I talk to some chefs, you know, they have a struggle with, you know, when are apples in season? When are, you know, squash? Because we're just used to going in a grocery store and seeing it year round. That's just not how it is in nature or, you know, in your local area. Sustainable diets, you know, sustainable eating is comprised of four main elements. Shifting diets away from heavy animal-based or highly processed foods to more plant-based and fresh. Not over or under consuming calories, reducing food waste. Purchasing responsibly produced foods. And I think you know, it goes hand in hand with food waste. I think sometimes responsibly produced foods do cost a little bit more money. So then I think you treat them with a little bit more respect and make sure you use every bit. You know, we eat a lot of chicken at home and then we freeze all the bones. And then once I fill up two gallons of black bags, then I know I have enough to make uh, some stock with it. Getting 100% use as much as you can out of that chicken, the bones. And I either use a pressure cooker or crock pot and let it go overnight. Food waste management, can we reduce it on the farm level? If we can't reduce it there, can we feed the hungry people? feed it to animals, industrial composter, biodigesters, or composting it. The last thing we should be doing is incinerating it. And then you know, I've showed you some, you know, all food scraps, everything that we save from the culinary labs. This is coming from the Sixth Street Cafe. They do a lot of coffee over there. So it all gets put in the, it gets composted. And then these are some garden beds. And again, they're growing a variety of, this was an organic gardening class up in the Mekong campus. They have this class every other year and they use some of our compost to grow different things. And then they did a different variety of garlic. They had never done it before, but there isn't one type of garlic. There's a variety of types of garlic. And if you look at them, you know, some garlics are are better to eat raw. Some are better for roasting. Some are more sharp. Some are more subtle. They learned about all the different types of garlic, and then we had a garlic tasting at school where we tasted the different types of garlic. And then if you click on this link, it'll bring you up to Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. This is, you know, there's more than one type of beet. You know, you've got all sorts of different types of beet. You can click on the link, you know, and it kind of tells you what it's like, good keeper. You know, so sometimes a lot of beets we eat, you know, grow and eat them right away, but, you know, this one is good for keeping soil. So if you have a root cellar, you might grow some for eating during the season, but then grow some of these because they store well. So that was interesting, you know, it was a win-win. We saved food waste, and then we all learned about different types of garlics and what to do with them. And then this was at Victory Gardens over on the east side. Potatoes, we, this was our first little trial. And then again, these potatoes, we got about 120 pounds of potatoes from our food compost, some students in the spring planted them and I had brought some students in the fall. And this was our trial, we were just testing to see what was underground. We had three different varieties that we were able to taste. See the different tastes, textures. This is a great film and normally I show this in class but I can't because of digital privacy stuff. But it's Seed, the untold story. A little over an hour, but it really talks about saving seeds and how people are trying to bring back some lost seeds. And it talks about seed, seed banks. And it's just a great film. I wish I could show it in class, but I can't. But I wanted to at least put it in here to mention it. The other one is Wasted, a food waste. It was produced by Anthony Bourdain. Rest in peace. And it's another great movie about, normally show this in class, but it really talks about food waste. And it goes from trying to reduce it at the farm level to you know repurposing food and people and right down the list to composting. It's on Amazon, Amazon Prime. I think it's four or five bucks. Once we can socially, not socially distance, or maybe you could socially distance, a couple of people could run one. It's a, again, it's a great movie. And then just some of the discussion questions. And that's it. So hopefully, let me know if you like this style of video better. I, I kind of went back and forth, but it was great teaching. Having you guys all this sem semester, really a great group. Of students hopefully you learn something you know use it at home use it at work and if you ever need anything questions concerns I'm always available and with that I will say have a good day thanks mm -hmm.